and welcome to the second episode of the Raspberry Pi Pod podcast. My name is Michael Horn, I'm a Raspberry Pi enthusiast and blogger. Thank you all for your feedback for episode one. It really helps to know that there's people out there listening and watching. Keep the comments coming, I'd love to make this more interactive as we go. As before, if I mention something in the podcast, I'll add a link to it in the post on my blog to save reading out massive URLs. Let's start off with some news. The Foundation have announced a new look desktop environment for Raspbian. The new system is called Pixel and features a new splash screen, new icons, gorgeous background photographs and new window styles. They've also added Real VNC and Chromium browser to the downloadable image. The move away from Epiphany browser to Google's Chromium marks a step change in browser compatibility and I think is a great move. GPIO0 is now one year old and the team has celebrated by releasing version 1.3. The new version has a ton of new features including a new button board class, new servo and angular servo classes, a new CPU temperature class, improved remote GPIO support and plenty of behind the scenes changes. There was also lots of new recipes which is what they call mini tutorials available. GPIO 0 has really come a long way it's the simplest way that I know of to deal with the GPIO pins. What's next for the library? We just don't know, but we hope it will be fantastic as it has been so far. There's a new edition of the Magpie out. This is issue 50. The centerpiece of the issue is a massive feature on what they consider to be the top 50 Pi projects. Some chosen by the community and some chosen by judges. Myself and Tim were lucky enough to be asked to judge the robot category, which was great fun. You can get the issue from all good news agents, via the apps, or free in PDF format by downloading it from the Magpie website. The teams for Pi Wars 2017 have now been chosen and are being notified. The robotics competition, in which all robots must have a Raspberry Pi at their core, will take place on the 1st and 2nd of April next year at the Cambridge Computer Laboratory. Myself and Tim spent a couple of evenings at the beginning of this week sifting through the 120 applications to pick out 76 competitors, some reserves and some show and tell exhibitors. Hopefully by the end of Sunday this week everyone will know where they stand and what place they've got. Lastly in the news section, the Raspberry Pi Foundation is looking for a videographer to join the team to do filming, editing and production. The role will be based in Cambridge and there's a full job description online. You've got until Monday the 10th of October to apply so if you are interested, get your portfolio in order sooner rather than later. That's it for the news. Let's have a look at some new and updated products. The big announcement this week is that Pi Supply has launched a new range of audio boards called Just Boom. There's a whole host of hats and fats in the range including amps and DACs and they're on pre-order for a mid-October dispatch clearly a direct competitor to other audio boards out there, in most notably IQ Audio's range. I'm hoping to get a hold of some of the hardware in the next few weeks to review and compare it and see how it stacks up against other boards. The Pi Hut has taken on the Western Digital Pi Drive range. There's a 314GB hard drive, cable and caddy. The Pi Drive can run straight off the Pi's USB ports without a separate power supply and is a great solution if you need some storage such as for a media centre setup. A couple of crowdfunded projects have just started to hit doormats. The first is the Next Dock which is effectively a laptop without innards but with an HDMI input which is what most laptops don't have. Albert Hickey has been working out how to use the device with the Pi and the Pi Zero and hopefully he'll be writing up this in a how-to soon. In the meantime, take a look at Les Pounder's review, which is linked in the blog post. The second campaign to hit is the Pi Top Seed. Albert Hickey's also got one of these, and I was lucky enough to see it at a recent Cam Jam. It's fair to say I was intrigued by it. It seems sturdy, functional, and a great platform for kids to learn how to program in a gamified environment. Well worth looking at, and very cost effective at around £100-£110. In the next episode I hope to bring you a review of the Pi Cap from Bear Conductive which is a plug-in add-on board for the Pi which converts the GPIO pins into crocodile clip compatible pads and seems excellent for touch capacitive sensor readings. But that will be the next episode. That's it for products. 
Now I'd like to look at a few new crowdfunding campaigns for the Pi. And none of them are pink this time. The first one is from Dexter Industries in the States and it's called Spy vs Spy. It's an educational system that brings together their GrovePi sensor board and spy themed resources to teach children how to program with practical exercises. I'm actually quite excited about this one. Dexter always produces high quality products. They tend to be on the pricey side and this one's no exception, but you do get what you pay for. Here's a cut down version of their campaign video for those who haven't seen the campaign yet. Spy vs Spy can be played alone at home or in teams in a classroom or workshop. In it, each spy is assigned a series of missions, each requiring them to write code that will allow them to protect their jewel in different ways, or capture the jewel of a competing spy. Spy vs Spy is based on the Grove Pi, an easy to build robot kit that includes a rich collection of programmable plug and play components, from sensors for things like distance, sound, light, and infrared, to buttons, buzzers, and more. Thanks to the Grove Pi's combination of hardware and software, Spy vs. Spy makes it easy to connect to a robot, start writing code, and get rewarding results right away. Each spy will learn how to program the different sensors and components with step-by-step -step instructions, all while completing a mission. Spy vs. Spy challenges students to do and to make by giving them realistic obstacles they can only overcome by thinking, learning, and ultimately doing, all while running their own spy operation. Tony Chang from Rodopia has been in touch about his latest Kickstarter. It's for a range of boards to add UART channels to the Raspberry Pi. They're not likely to appeal to a broad audience, but if you're looking for something to give you multiple UART channels, they look just the thing, so take a look at the campaign. It has a low funding goal, and it's sure to be funded. The next one is from Boston, Massachusetts. It's a USB hub for the Zero, giving three USB ports, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity. There's only a couple of days left on this one. For just $14 plus postage, you can give your Zero this extra functionality without increasing the footprint too much. It connects via pogo pins to the underside of the Zero, so there's no soldering required. The final crowdfunding project for this week is another Kickstarter. I'm a bit of a sucker for blinky things, and lots of them, and the Spirit Rover is blinkier than most. The Spirit Rover is a robotics kit that features a custom PCB, a chassis, a Raspberry Pi, a camera module, and a pan and tilt kit. Along the chassis supplied are loads of NeoPixel-like LEDs, and the kit comes with worksheets to help you get into robotics, build the kit, and program the robot. It does come at a price, $189 for the basic kit, and another $100 on top of that for the fully loaded kit, which includes the Pi and the camera module. It's very nice, but a little bit pricey maybe. Today, we're proud to share our newest creation, the Spirit Rover, a desktop version of the famous rover sent to Mars. Our miniature version of the real thing is built around a Raspberry Pi computer and includes an Arduino-compatible processor, along with a ton of sensors and smarts. Whether you're new to programming or an experienced pro, Spirit is a perfect robot platform for learning to program in Python and C, as well as learning the inner workings of the Linux operating system. Tutorials and lessons will guide you along the way. You'll code and control your own rover missions while learning how computer vision and autonomous robots work. Remote control your missions using Wi-Fi from a computer, tablet, smartphone, or a game controller. Spirit is an ideal platform for teaching in classroom environments, playing on your own at home, and even used in serious research. Next up, I'd like to tell you about some events that are coming up. Just to kick things off, videos of the talks from the recent Cambridge Raspberry Jam on the 17th of September are now available on YouTube. So if you'd like to catch the talks on some great topics, head over to the Cam Jam YouTube channel. The link's in the blog post. The Raspberry Pi Foundation are running two events, one in Glasgow, one in Cambridge. They are both sold out, but it's great to see them on the calendar, and it's great to see Ben Nuttall back running events like he used to. Coming up in the next few weeks, we have a lot of events coming up. The 3rd of October brings us the long-running Preston Raspberry Jam, it's an evening jam hosted by techno teacher himself, Alan O'Donoghue. On the evening of 5th of October, Claire Garside is hosting the Leeds Raspberry Jam. On the 8th of October, there's an Ipswich Raspberry Jam. This is looking to be a really good one, and also on the 8th are jams in Blackpool, Guildford, Manchester, Belfast and Torbay. Over in the States on the 10th of October, an evening jam is being held in Piscataway, New Jersey. Stafford Raspberry Jam is on the 11th of October, run by young Keris Locke. On the 15th of October, there's a jam in St. Louis. 
On the 16th of October, Dr. Lucy Rogers is holding a jam on the Isle of Wight. Expect dinosaurs. Also on the 16th of October, Albert Hickey is hosting the 12th Egg and Raspberry Jam. It's a really good one that's held in an evening at Gartner headquarters. I thoroughly recommend it. Further afield, there are jams in Seattle, Dundee, Coventry, East London and Raleigh in Essex. They're coming up in the latter half of October. If you'd like to advertise your event on the podcast, just make sure it's on the calendar at raspberrypie.org and I'll pick it up next time I prepare for an episode. Alternatively, you can send me an audio clip telling me about your jam and I'll edit it into the podcast. Now moving on to some Raspberry Pi projects that I've come across in the last couple of weeks. Martin Hertig has taken a guitar bag, hooked up an Arduino to the zips via conductive thread to make a MIDI controller and then added a Raspberry Pi into the mix to create his project called Zippy. The Pi runs fluid synth synthesizer software, just like my music box does, to play the sounds. One zip is for playing notes or chords, one controls vibrato and one changes the bar. Jamie Dixon has trouble getting his youngest child out of bed, don't we all? So he grabbed hold of an old electric hospital bed and that could be triggered to go almost vertical. He hooked it up to a servo and a Raspberry Pi and wrote a program on the Windows 10 IoT operating system to control the servo. A simple web interface and a wireless router connected to the Pi lets him control the position of the sleeping surface. This wins the award for dodgiest piece of clip art of the week. Adafruit do some fantastic builds and this next one is really great and by great I mean tiny. Philip Burgess has blogged about the project which involves a Raspberry Pi Zero inside the world's tiniest working MAME arcade cabinet. They've used the Zero together with a 0.96 inch OLED display, an amplifier, some tiny speakers and then installed MAME on the SD card. I love art projects and this is a really good one. Clodagh O'Mahony, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, recently completed her thesis on interaction design. For her project, she constructed a dress which had a Raspberry Pi and an Adafruit capacitive touch sensor breakout embedded into it under a 3D printed shroud. Thanks to a lot of conductive thread, the dress detects touches in various places and logs the social interactions to a database. The Pi then reads this data and lights up the dress in different colours with a Pimeroni blinked. The dress also registers vocal social interactions and reacts depending on whether the words are categorised as positive or negative. The data is also uploaded to a website where interactions are awarded points. For build photos and a write-up of the build, use the link in the blog post. At the big birthday weekend last March, I met my match when I played a Raspberry Pi powered Connect 4 machine. It beat me soundly, due to stupidity on my part. The creator of the project, David Pride, has created a Pi driven air drum kit that uses two Wii controllers to play drum samples. There's more to read on the blog post and he's open sourced all of his code onto GitHub. Jeroen van Gore and Johan Ten Brick from the Netherlands saw a v-plotter on the Polygraph website and decided they wanted to create their own version to create works of art. What they came up with was called Black Stripes. Black Stripes is powered by a Raspberry Pi and features some stepper motors and wooden arms. The machines come in a variety of designs, sizes and configurations and are able to use many different stick drawing implements such as pencils, pens and markers to create stunning works of art. You can read a lot more about their services and the machines that you can buy yourself on their website. See the blog post that's for the link. The author, William Gibson, is responsible for a lot of the terminology that is used to describe the hacking community and the tools it uses. He's a cyberpunk author and one of his series of books is called Sprawl. Part of that series deals with a hacking machine called a Cyberdeck. D10D3 on Imager has taken an old Commodore 64, non-functioning you'll be pleased to hear, and packed it with a Raspberry Pi 3 and some other components to create his very own cyber deck for hacking. There are loads more pictures on Imager, so check out the blog post for the link. And now for my project of the week. 
Florian has trouble waking up in the morning. Seems to be a common thing among hackers this week. So much so that he decided to create his own sunrise clock. Circadia is a tube that's almost two meters tall and is transparent to allow light to shine through it. This is a full multimedia experience using 288 bright RGB LEDs and sound to deliver the sunrise experience. There's a persistence of vision time display at the top as well and the whole thing is controlled via a series of themes loaded into a Python program. It took him two years to put together but I think you'll agree it was well worth it and you can see it from the video. That's it for this episode. I'm always on the lookout for Raspberry Pi news and projects, but I don't catch everything. So if you've done something cool with the Pi, let me know. Catch you next time.